Hello everyone and welcome to the Trinity Longroom Hub. We are still online, obviously. Uh, my name is Eve Patton, I'm Director of the Hub and I'm very pleased to welcome you to uh, the latest in our Faculty in Focus sessions. And the Faculty in Focus sessions give us an opportunity to catch up with one of our colleagues in Arts and Humanities and find out a bit about what they've been doing and, and to talk a little bit uh, about their research. Uh, so today I'm really pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Hamilton. Uh, Peter, you're very welcome to the Hub. Peter lectures in modern Chinese history uh, and he's based in the Department of History and also in Trinity's Centre for Asian Studies. But he's the author of a new book which has the great title Made in Hong Kong. Uh, and he's going to be telling us a little bit more about this over the course of the hour. He's going to be in conversation with Dr. Isabella Jackson. Isabella is also uh, from Trinity's Center for Asian Studies. Uh, and I know many of you will know her from previous appearances uh, in the Trinity Long Room Hub. Isabella, many thanks. Very good to see you again. Um, the conversation will take the best part of an hour and you will have a chance to ask questions. Uh, so please, if you have a question, put it into the Q&A panel. If you're on Facebook, you can also use the Facebook uh, site to put in a question to us. And of course, as always, uh, if you want to, you can tweet using at TLR Hub and the hashtag Hub Matters. Um, I'm really pleased to see so many people in the Hub Zoom room today. And I know we have some special guests with us uh, and uh, Isabella will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but for now, uh, enjoy the Faculty in Focus and let me hand over to you, Isabella, for uh, the conversation with Peter. Thank you, Eve. Thank you very much um, and welcome everybody. Um, the special guests that Eve mentioned are um, our alumni from um, Hong Kong. So particular welcome to Henry Oh, um, the director of the Trinity Alumni Association in Hong Kong. And thank you very much for inviting all of your uh, colleagues and peers there. It's really nice to be able to welcome alumni to events like this. Um, but also welcome to Peter. And um, it's great timing to be having this session because your book is hot off the press, just published by Columbia University Press. And I'll, I'll give the full title. Um, it is Made in Hong Kong, Trans-Pacific Networks and a New History of Globalization. And I've been reading it. It really is highly readable, very engaging and enjoyable and really authoritative. So I strongly recommend it to anybody with an interest in Hong Kong or capitalism or the history of globalization. It has a lot to teach us all and it does reorientate our understanding of globalization. So I think it's gonna make quite a splash. Um, so we'll be mainly talking uh, this lunchtime about that book. Um, but before we do, I'd just like to get up to that point by thinking, Peter, how you, um, how your career has gone to date. Um, so, you know, your interests are mainly on the economic history of Hong Kong and its trans-Pacific connections in the Cold War era. Um, how did you first get interested in the history of Hong Kong? Well, thank you so much for, for doing this and for, uh, to the Long Room for hosting. It's a real honor. Um, so I'd studied Chinese history and Mandarin language as an undergraduate at Yale. Um, but it wasn't my exclusive focus then. And then I went to Hong Kong after college to teach with the Yale China Association for two years. And on the side, I did an internship with some local historians who were completing a really massive project called the Dictionary of Hong Kong Biography. And so really my, my internship was about researching and, and fact checking and helping to write a lot of these entries. But in the process, in addition to learning a lot about Hong Kong history, I also got immersed in a whole kind of network of local Hong Kong historians who kind of showed me the city that they knew. And so I, I kind of got hooked that way. Um, and then when I went to graduate school at the University of Texas at Austin and started pursuing Chinese history more seriously in the classroom, um, the absence of Hong Kong throughout so much of that historiography mm. was just really striking to me. And so more and more, it just kind of became what I felt like I had to contribute um, in terms of, of going forward. And so that, of course, was a process across the, the PhD as to how I, how I ended up researching what I researched. Mm. Yeah, it is um, 
odd to me how neglected Hong Kong has been until very recently in the scholarship on the history of, of China and that whole region. Why do you think that is? It's really complex and difficult question to answer. I think that part of it is is political in in the sense of um, the both inside China and outside China, the role that that Marxism has played in academic thought made incorporating a capitalistic colony into the main narrative of modern China very problematic for a lot of different kinds of scholars. Um, and I think that Hong Kong just doesn't, unless you know it well, it doesn't fit into a lot of the models and narratives that we wanted to focus on and that scholars emphasized in our debates. You know, Hong Kong has never had a revolution. It, it never became part of a nation state directly. Um, and until now, it's it's kind of left wing forces have, have historically been pretty weak, um, you know. And so, kind of the main themes of Hong Kong history of of mobility and pragmatism and adaptation and hybridity um, are just quite different, I think, from the histories of nation states and and the kind of the history of you know twentieth century Asia as we generally define them. Absolutely, it is a real outlier, Romanian colony until. 1997. So we'll we'll come back to that. Um, but before we do, you had never been to Ireland before you came to work at Trinity a couple of years ago. So no. you've lived obviously extensively in Hong Kong. You've lived all over the place. Um, tell us a little bit. You've touched on you know you're at Yale. Uh, you're at the University of Texas. Um, where have you enjoyed living most? Where has been more <laughs> challenged? How did you adjust to living in Ireland? <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I, my first visit to Ireland was for the final interview for this position. Uh, <laughs> so that from and I flew here from Beijing. Um, and unlike so many Americans, I my family is not of Irish descent. So there really was very little linkage before before I came to live here. Um, and it's academia has made me a perpetual or repeated migrant in many ways. And it's been both difficult and challenging in some sense, but also such a great privilege to live in so many different places. And so from Hong Kong, I moved to Austin for graduate school, but then throughout graduate school, I was kind of shuttling back and forth because my research increasingly focused on Hong Kong. Um, and then I did a postdoc at Columbia in New York, and then another postdoc at Schwartzman College at Tsinghua University in Beijing, and then here. Um, so it's, I kind of, it's kind of been a, an around the world tour, um, which is, again, challenging, but um, I think been intellectually helpful because it does help kind of keep things fresh and keep has kept reminding me throughout this process of what makes places similar and different, you know, kind of the way that different cultures do and cities and urban environments do structure behavior and thoughts in different ways. Um, Definitely, yeah. I work. It's been a privilege. Yeah, oh, well, I'm glad. And um, I work, oh, I have worked quite a lot on the history of Shanghai, which is often compared to Hong Kong and um, looking at the ways in which they're similar but also very different is, is quite fruitful. So um, I get what you're saying in terms of comparing cities. Um, so this is the book based on your PhD dissertation, um, yes. but obviously you've been through these postdocs in different places which will have influenced it. Could you talk us a little bit through that journey of turning a PhD dissertation into a monograph, which is something that you know a, a lot of people will be doing people in the audience or have done uh, but it's not easy not easy and, and definitely a journey it has evolved very substantially because you know the, the initial framing of the dissertation even before i did the actual research of the dissertation was really much more about um u.s interests and agency in hong kong as a state um and kind of the cold war diplomatic tensions between in particular beijing and washington in hong kong kind of following in the path blazed by Chi Quan Mark on this. But then as I did more research, you know, in the course of the dissertation, kind of was pulled towards, you know, being really convinced that the story of the Hong Kong elites was really the prime agency in this story that I wanted to emphasize. And so the dissertation ended up kind of as a, a an amalgam, an unwieldy amalgam of all these different things. But then over the course of the book process has been much more honed um, to kind of focus primarily on this particular agency and utilizing all the amazing, as much as I can, all the amazing digital primary sources that are not available, that were not available when I did the dissertation and that the progress there has been so extraordinary. The best example, which I think is useful for so many people in their research is that 
when I did the dissertation, you know, to access Hong Kong newspapers, I accessed them in person, either the actual bound copies of them at the central library or the um, microfilm reels. Mm -hmm. You know, and now any person anywhere in the world can access all Hong Kong Chinese and English language newspapers that are extant um, through the central library. And, and, you know, and that just speeds up and enables so many different kinds of research that weren't possible, you know, five, six years ago. Absolutely. And, you know, sources are the bread and butter of historians. So um, everything rests on the sources you can access and, and what you do with them. Um, could you tell us in, in a nutshell, what's the argument of this book? So the book reframes Hong Kong as a crucial node in the expansion of post-war US-led global capitalism and then the reintegration of China since the 1970s into that system. Um, and that you know, predominantly in the previous literature about Hong Kong's economic development and its place in post-war global capitalism, it was largely kind of described as either a small British colony or framed in these problematic models of kind of an East Asian tiger or little dragon. And so instead I tried to really foreground Hong Kong as a, as a unique actor in its own right at the center of key interlocking global processes of trade, investment, but also education, migration, um, and in particular kind of homing in on this particular Hong Kong elite who fled to Hong Kong during the communist revolution and showing their very successful strategies to kind of move Hong Kong away from the sinking British empire and increasingly integrate it first with the United States over the 1950s and 1960s. And then when it became possible to do so to integrate China and the United States from the 1970s. And so kind of through these, these kind of very mobile Hong Kong Chinese elites, we had a very different picture of globalization, um, and one in which the, the driving agency is not coming from the global north, but instead primarily from colonial and post-colonial Asian elites whose previous histories had positioned them to exploit decolonization, capitalist integration, the Cold War, et cetera, all from this very intersectional place. Mm. So, you know, once you pointed out, it is clear that when we've talked about globalization before, we've tended to assume it was white people taking the lead. And um, it turns out if you look at Hong Kong, you see that really isn't the case. And we have to question where a lot of those assumptions came from. Yes, the so-called third world um, generally only figures in these narratives as a, as a passive part of the story, either you know, as, as um, the recipient of aid um, or as a, a victim you know, that is acted upon by global northern agendas. And that Hong Kong helps to show us that it, we need a much more nuanced terrain here. Um, and that Hong Kong elites, ha, you know, were very well positioned to uh, both by their own backgrounds and the particular opportunities that Hong Kong as a place gave them um, to exert their own influence and agenda over how these things played out and to enrich themselves um, kind of at the intersection of all this. So can we just explain precisely what you mean by the title? I remember talking with you when you were working out what the title might be. <laughs> what, you had iterations. Different <laughs> ideas, um, but I love what you went for in the end. But what are you saying was made in Hong Kong? And what are you saying about the history of globalization just in the title there? So the most basic level, the idea is to emphasize that before made in China, what was made in Hong Kong anticipated and enabled what came later in terms of China's kind of extraordinary export driven development. And that Hong Kong played a very key role that you really have to dig into the weeds in order to see a lot of the time. Um, but then more broadly, the idea of made in Hong Kong is to challenge and revise those kind of Eurocentric assumptions about where globalization happened and where it was driven from um, and kind of showing these these more nuanced terrains you know, mm. particular places and even within particular places particular people who were you know, to put it I guess very simply kind of did the actual work of globalization of moving things here and there. Um, and you coin uh, a couple of uh, very interesting terms. Could you talk us through the Kwa Shan 
and this idea of informal decolonization, which I find very useful as a concept. But these are your own coinages, so. Yes. Um, so the Kwashiung term is my term for the strategies of trans-Pacific integration that these particular Hong Kong elites pursued. And in some sense, it's a pun on Huashan, which means overseas Chinese merchants. And there's a very large literature on overseas Chinese merchants or Huashan, who found commercial opportunities over many centuries in large part, not exclusively, but in large part through collaboration with European colonial empires in Asia. Um, and after 1945, as those European colonial empires disintegrated, many places that had been similar to Hong Kong, other free colonial port cities and free ports were absorbed into these nation states. And that Hong Kong becomes increasingly very unusual as an extension of this older world. And so Huashang in Hong Kong um, continued on, but now they kind of needed to collaborate with the new hegemon and that's the expanding US empire. Um, and as a result had to adapt their strategies and that is what the Kwashiung strategies are as the adaptation of previous kinds of collaboration with European empires toward the new US hegemon. Um, and kind of piggybacking off that, informal decolonization is my term for kind of their, if you want to call it a political agenda, um, the ways in which as these Kwashiung strategies paid off into new forms of power and privilege in Hong Kong, that many of these Hong Kong Chinese elites then became increasingly assertive about um, claiming positions of status and influence and decision-making over Hong Kong, away primarily from British hands. Um, that their, their goal was not to overthrow the Hong Kong colonial government, which would have harmed their interests, but instead to steer it in a direction that was more useful for themselves, um, and even to some sense hollow it out for private gain um, by claiming these positions and pushing their own agendas onto the Hong Kong government. And that's, that's what I try to capture by informal decolonization. Because the Hong Kong colonial government is quite absent as an actor in this book. It, it comes in a little bit, but is that a deliberate effort on your part to decenter the colonial authorities? Or is it just that it isn't that important a player in this story? I always wanted to return agency to Hong Kong people who absolutely did drive their own economic development and, and miracle, if you want to call it that. Um, that is not to say, though, that the British colonial government was not an important actor. I, I, I think the best way that I can phrase it is that they were an important supporting actor. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to be very, very careful about how we describe and analyze that role, particularly the British colonial government. Um, if it had been an unqualified benefit, we might expect more British, former British colonies to have achieved similar kinds of economic success. And in reality, Hong Kong is very unusual. It's very singular, even far outpacing at the time, the nearest closest example of Singapore. Um, so I think that finance is actually a really good example here to kind of flush this out with more nuance in part because the literature here is more developed. Um, and that is scholars such as Catherine Schenk and YC Zhao have explored on one part on one hand, um, British firms such as the Hong Kong Bank and British imperial systems such as the Sterling area were absolutely crucial to the development of banking in Hong Kong in the post-war period. Um, but simultaneously, the banking sector in Hong Kong was notoriously unregulated. Um, before 1965, the banking ordinance did not require any reserve requirements, uh, did not even require banks to submit balance sheets. And so very predictably that created and gendered um, you know, routine instability, banking crises, rampant speculation, fraud, um, and all sorts of other negative impacts as well. And so that in all the ways that British colonial governments can be attributed to be helpful or more beneficial to Hong Kong's economic development, a holistic perspective demands that we also incorporate all the ways in which it was negative or harmful. You know, and that um, another great example, I think that people point to a lot is, is law, you know, and the law, common law systems as a source of stability, which they were by and large, but again, we should point out that it was official policy into the 1970s to ignore 
rampant corruption, organized crime, and quite a very serious drug trafficking problem in Hong Kong. And so British law you know, in a holistic picture was a you know, multivalent factor upon Hong Kong's development. Yes, indeed. And um, that might not be surprising to our Irish audience. No, um, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving away from, from the British influence, what does this story tell us about the USA's soft power or um, neo-imperial, I think you, you even call it imperial projection of power in the Cold War era? Um, it seems to have been successful in bringing Hong Kong into its sphere, sphere of influence. Is, is that a story of US policy success or should we look at it in a different way? It highlights two different sides of this and that on one level, as, as you point out, the US imperial agendas operated in just a different way than your U European imperial agendas, often in ways that have been missed because they were deliberately quite subtle and even covert. You know, And then in the case of Hong Kong, the British colonial government very actively restricted the most overt forms of US propaganda, espionage and other attempts to interfere <laughs> in local matters. Um, but what's been missed is that then the way that US kind of soft power and cultural diplomacy in Hong Kong shifts, most especially into, into simply what we might call money laundering, um, money through from the US government through back channels into all forms of schools, churches, community centers, and other forms of higher education um, in order to steer these institutions toward US agendas. And very often, kind of this is one of the ways in which I kind of got cued into this, it's these US educated and often US oriented elites, Chinese elites who are running these institutions who are fully aware of where the money is coming from um, and kind of are in this very interesting kind of interstitial position um, to represent and lead this organization and benefit from it. But simultaneously, they're working with, with the US behind the scenes and, and are aware of who they're working with. Mm. Um, but on the second side, I, you know, I, uh, what I most in part wanted to show was that for all the US agendas that are there, often the, the really decisive agency comes from Hong Kong Chinese elites who are, um, rather than the US pulling Hong Kong into its sphere of influence, who are really cozying themselves up to US power because it suits them to do so at this time period and, and kind of pulling Hong Kong toward the US for their own benefit um, in terms of all sorts of professional aspirations, career, career and kind of uh, reconstituting themselves after fleeing to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And in particular, kind of something that people often now forget is that uh, from 1949 on, many, many people assumed that Hong Kong would eventually be invaded by the PRC. Um, and so for many of these people, this is also very actively about preparing for that, what they think is an event horizon um, and, and preparing for their, their escape strategies um, and which cozying up to the US for those kind of exit options was very actively discussed and, and part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a route to US citizenship. Um... Yes, and that and that's where the, the interest in higher education in part also came from is that they're very aware in part because of prior Republican histories of the ways in which US higher education was a, a door to all sorts of positive things, you know, and that all these things could be worked towards at once, you know, prestigious degree, useful knowledge, bilingualism, useful contacts, but also a legal step towards migration um, in a variety of Variety of ways, and U.S. U.S. immigration law is evolving very rapidly, you know, over these years as well. So it it shifts, you know, depending on the the time we're talking about. But um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about these uh, these Hong Kong elites. You introduce us in the book to quite a lot of individual families and um, key figures within them. Are these people who would be well known in Hong Kong, or are they kind of? only known in their own particular business circles, but they are driving uh, the economy of the um, of Hong Kong forward? It really depends. And I think it depends in part on who you are now, but also the time period, you know, and kind of, again, even what realm of life you were operating in. And most of these figures were not then and are not now household names. Um, some such as Vice Chancellor Li Chou Ming of the Chinese University would still be pretty 
well known among academics at least and people who are associated with the Chinese university. Um, while others such as Ansi Lee Sperry or H.J. Shen, the banker, uh, quite unknown, uh, you know, were prominent at the time period, but are not held up very much today. You know, and particularly in the uh, business realm, popular public public discourse tends to celebrate these kind of rags to riches real estate tycoons like Li Kangxing. And as I say at the front of the book, this is a, not a book about those people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's you know those kind of very um, extreme examples are really very unusual and that in reality the vast majority of Hong Kong elites come from a long line of inherited privilege that came with them mm -hmm. from the mainland and yet we don't actually know that much about them um, and so kind of showing this this larger kind of class if you will mm -hmm. you know or at least some some figures from that class and they had migrated multiple times potentially if they had perhaps come typically from Shanghai to Hong Kong and the um, you know, sort of uh, as the communists approached um, in 1948-49, they had, most of them, their families would have arrived in Shanghai from somewhere else, uh, maybe somewhere close by, um, uh, maybe Ningbo, um, but maybe further away. People went up to Shanghai from Guangdong and then could have hopped yep. over back down to <laughs> Hong Kong. So um, did they retain, this is interesting to me as someone who works on Shanghai, did they retain those kind of original native place identities or once they had come from Shanghai to Hong Kong, were they just seen as people who had originated in Shanghai? And then how quickly did they or did they not integrate into Hong Kong Cantonese speaking society? Yeah, the people who become called Shanghainese in Hong Kong, as, as you point out, you know, really are actually from a wider swath of, kind of lower Jiangnan, lower, you know, lower Yangtze, Jiangnan region, um, Wuxi, Ningbo, other places. And that it's part of the reason that I felt I needed to begin the story in essence in 1937. Um, and that many of these families, particularly a theme that emerged and came out over the course of the research was how many of these families had first begun relocating, most especially in, in during the war, you know, and taking refuge in the foreign concessions mm -hmm. during the war in order to kind of preserve their business interests and collaborating with Japan and kind of showing this continual theme of collaboration um, before relocating again, you know, in the years surrounding 1949. Um, and then in Hong Kong, it just really depends, you know, and it, at first kind of a, if you will, a first generation of migrants from Shanghai really did retain a pretty high kind of association with that culture and the Wu dialect as a form of identity. Um, often living together, so North Point was, was called Little Shanghai at this time, so often settling in some areas together. Um, and forming, you know, as, as would be familiar to any scholar of China, kind of native, reforming the native place associations. So the kind of combining the Jiangsu Zhejiang native place association into one big association at this time. Mm -hmm. um, but how much they integrated into local society really depends on the person. You know, mm -hmm. and that some of the examples, you know, intermarried and, and kind of uh, raised their children also speaking Cantonese, but a very high number of them, such as the Tang family that I use throughout the book as, as a through line, um, uh, never learned ca Cantonese and were quite proud of that fact even. Um, they kind of looked down on Hong Kong as, as a backwater that they considered beneath them. Um, mm. So their whole life continued in, in English and Shanghainese. Mm. It's funny how um, Hong Kong and Shanghai have sort of bounced back and forth as to which one was in the ascendancy and which one was a comparative backwater and they have swapped <laughs> a couple of times, haven't they? Um, yes, you know, and, and um, as I point out, you know, there, there definitely are some migrants from Shanghai whose origins are Cantonese originally, right. actually, <laughs> exactly. uh, but became Shanghainese over, yeah. the, over that century. Yeah. Um, now, we've been talking about elite men. Um, what role, if any, do women play in this story? And is there anything to say also about kind of ordinary Hong Kongers, people who may have worked for these elites, um, but also you know, played a part in the colony becoming so um, at least wealthy in terms of um, uh, its finance and GDP and manufacturing and so on? Mm. 
So as I say in the book at one point, you know, inadvertently, it is really a story about patriarchy, mm -hmm. uh, that this, this, my sources at least were filled with men um, in, in very large part because fathers chose sons over daughters um, for these prestigious higher educations and then often to inherit the company or, or take over in various ways. Um, that's not, of course, to say that women were unimportant and that, you know, particularly within these Kwashiung families, trying to highlight as much as possible as the sources can of the ways in which um, you know, the matriarchs of the family were decisive bearers of social capital, um, often very influential advocates about the educational choices for their children, and often just as shamelessly elitist as their husband about some of these, these decisions. Um, in terms of ordinary Hong Kong people, though, of course, you know, um, uh, the primary contribution um, was their exploited labor, um, and that you know Hong Kong's manufacturing boom throughout the 1950s and 1960s is uh, people debate the use of the term sweatshop in various various forms, but it it is a uh, you know there's no minimum wage, uh, they're very long hours, the factories run 24 hours a day, often they don't have air conditioning, um, it's a big innovation and and game changer when air conditioning does come in. Um, and very often women, um, as, as in Shanghai, uh, before 1949, the majority of textile workers were, were women and remained women in Hong Kong, um, as well as children. We should, we should emphasize that child labor was legal in Hong Kong, in part because of some of the people um, in this project um, who successfully pressured the Hong Kong colonial government to lift its previous bans on child labor um, in order to, so they have the right to work. Um, you know, before the introduction of universal primary education. Um, when did that come in? 1971, um, which is part of the, I think, the interesting conundrum around all of this, that, you know, as late as the 1960s, I think it's something around 15, 18%, only 15 or 18% of Hong Kong people at, even attend secondary school, you know, and universal primary education is not achieved until 1971, you know, and simultaneously in the very same years, Hong Kong is, becoming the world's largest sender of foreign students to US colleges and universities. And so you have a huge gap there, um, a kind of grotesque inequality that is playing out in, in this development model um, that I at least argue, you know, we really have to look at on its own terms. Mm, mm. And that's um, when uh, people sometimes point to Hong Kong as this uh, great example of the success of a laissez-faire um, approach to uh, governing an economy, uh, that's that's the downside that it's not. <laughs> yes, it's very political. Um, and that um, as with the role of the British colonial government, you know, we have to be very, very careful to be as holistic as possible when we talk about Hong Kong as this free market laissez-faire miracle. You know, and that in part, the origin of that narrative comes from the Hong Kong government itself, you know, and that they called it the Hong Kong story. Uh, and they, they talked about this all the time in public speeches and things like that throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way down through the 1997 handover. It's the, it's the gist of Chris Patton's speech at, during the handover of, of this laissez-faire um, development as they see it that they enabled. Um, and that kind of what I'm trying to highlight here is that at the very least, you have to incorporate another half of this story mm -hmm. when you want to talk about that narrative um, and highlight the, the grotesque inequality here and the, the exploitation that um, not all Hong Kong people were in any way compared to compete in a fair, in any kind of fair way. Um, and that instead you have a development model that I think anyone would be very cautious about emulating um, in which some people became very, very wealthy. Um, and the, the, as I think it's chapter six, um, highlight, you know, Hong Kong's GDP per capita went up 600% in the 1970s, you know, carrying it directly from the middle of the third world, quote unquote, into the first and putting it right on par with Ireland actually in 1980. Um, but that those benefits are by no means equally shared. You know, it's, you're, you're really talking about the empowerment and creation of a, of a, global elite in the form of these these Hong Kong tycoons um, mm. reap the lion's share of the benefits from from this model. And it's in that period, the 70s um, and moving into the 80s, that you suggest in the book Hong Kong played a pivotal role in the 
opening up of mainland China um, to to the US to the kind of um, increasingly globalized economy. Could you expand on that for us today and explain what's your new contribution really in understanding the origins of that uh, reform and opening up process? So by roughly about 1960, Hong Kong's major trading partner and investment partner is the United States. I mean, it has shifted really radically in that direction. Uh, and kind of one of the you know, kind of main figures there, you know, dis regularly describes the US market as life and death for Hong Kong. Um, so when Sino-US trade, uh, oh, I have an alarm going off in my building. Um, when Sino-US trade um, reopens in 1971, that's a really key signal for Hong Kong companies of all shapes and sizes um, that they can increasingly engage with mainland labor on behalf of their US clients. And of course, this you know, goes slowly at first, you know, but some you know, begin outsourcing things like matches, fireworks, et cetera, into the mainland from well before 1978. So chapter seven really tries to push back that timeline and that routine emphasis on 1978 as this major breakthrough period, ensuring that from Hong Kong's perspective, a lot of this was already in motion and common knowledge by the mid 1970s, that China was changing and that more opportunities were on the way, at least they assumed so kind of presumptuously even. Um, and that then from 1978, you're really talking about an acceleration of what was in motion already as more and more things become possible and become attractive. Um, but really emphasizing there that kind of, uh, it was not inevitable. Um, these Hong Kong elites are primarily pursuing opportunities in the mainland, you know, as suits them and as they believe will be profitable. Um, and you know, and that that isn't a given. Um, even the, uh, <laughs> but in turn, that what they're doing in the mainland is a key contribution to the development process in a whole host of ways. You know, and that from you know, investment is the, is the one that's usually pulled out here and that Hong Kong has always been China's largest outside investor. And by the mid 1990s is handling about half of China's foreign trade, which is astounding when you think about it in terms of the size of China, the number of port cities that it has, but that half of its foreign trade is flowing through Hong Kong by that point. Um, but it's more than just dollars and cents. You know, and that um, in the case of a good example is, is Gordon Wu and the Guangshan Expressway that today links the whole Pearl River Delta. That was his idea, you know, and he's kind of does a lot of the very tedious work to push that project forward because he thinks it will be very profitable, um, but also because he can see in advance well before owning a car became a common thing in the PRC that this would be something you need to do now um, and prepare for, um, as well as all sorts of kind of technical knowledge and, that, uh, and kind of incorporation into regulatory structures. International trade is extremely regulated, even you know, at the height of this you know, triumphalism about capitalist globalization. And the best example is textiles and apparel, which is extremely regulated. Um, and Hong Kong, again, is the world's largest exporter of textiles and apparel to the US by the late 70s. So it, it has a very deep well of knowledge, but also just legal access to the US market through export quotas and things like that. Um, and China has none. Um, and so kind of, you know, that, that kind of pairing is very productive, but takes work, you know, and is not inevitable. Mm. And did the handover from British colonial rule to Beijing in 1997 have much of an effect on the world of these um, elites who you focus on? Or is it, by that point, they had reoriented, it didn't make much difference? Kind of look at the from their perspective i think the 1997 handover is is more of a the end of a process as you said that it kind of had already was already in motion and was put in motion by the handover negotiations from the early 80s the signing of the joint declaration in 1984 and this whole process of trust building and kind of um very strategic thinking about the long term of their economic interests um and that on one level, we have to emphasize that by and large, these are the children of people who fled communism, you know, and who had absolutely no love for the Chinese Communist Party, and thus 
were, there was a great deal of deeply embedded anti-communism and mistrust um, there. Um, but in time, they're won over um, through this kind of, as I call it, a bargain um, in which they come to believe that Hong Kong will enjoy genuine autonomy after 1997, and that China's economic reforms are real and are serious and will continue and aren't yet another 100 flowers campaign or cultural revolution kind of trick, um, you know, that they can trust that their investments will be secure. And so by the time that Tiananmen happens in 1989, largely that, that bed is already made um, and kind of um, their oral histories, I think, as I try to quote from, from one particularly um, revealing one, uh, they already were well aware of who they were working with um, and kind of made that decision that, well, they're, you know, surprise, <laughs> um, but continue on um, as soon as it is possible to do so. Um, and so that, that's part of what I think most this project, while it really isn't about the current unrest and, and other issues, um, does highlight the role that long before 1997, many Hong Kong elites had fully assessed the situation and had made their choice, um, and, you know, and done so quite, quite cognizantly about yeah. about what the possibilities were and what they were choosing to prioritize. Yes. Um, so we it is time to hand over to audience questions, and I see uh, quite a few questions appearing uh, now in the Q and A. Right. But before we do, I'd just like to ask one more because the questions are as as I'm not surprised to see focusing more on the present and the future. So. <laughs> In a, in a general sort of way, before we get into some of the specific questions um, that are coming out, um, you've spent you know a huge amount of time in Hong Kong. Uh, I don't. When was the last time you were in Hong Kong? Was it? I actually finished the manuscript there over the Chinese New Year month holiday uh, in 2019. Okay, uh, that so was the last big chunk uh, yeah. there since I came before I came to Trinity. Right. So. Just obviously, it's been in the news. Everyone's aware of um, of what's been happening, the recent legal changes in Hong Kong. Um, what's your best guess? I mean, it's not fair to ask historians about the future, but but as someone who's interested and well informed, what's your best guess to, about what's what's coming down the line? What what can we expect to see in the future in Hong Kong? Very difficult, you know. And as as any historian can tell you about any context, you know, history rarely unfolds in linear or rational ways and that um, many factors that you didn't realize at the time were important prove later to be very decisive in all sorts of different kinds of contexts. But I do think that across the course of Hong Kong history that Hong Kong people have proven themselves continually to be very pragmatic, adaptive, and mobile. Um, and that you know, Hong Kong has continually defied the odds in many forms of crises and turned those crises into opportunities um, in various forms. Um, kind of the quote I always think of, which is a little, you know, many Hong Kong people would roll their eyes, but you know, that I think is useful for if the audience is less familiar with Hong Kong is kind of the quote of um, Hong Kong's perhaps most famous son, Bruce Lee, you know, to, to be as water, you know, and that water adapts, water survives. Um, and that that in some sense, you know, I think does capture a lot of the spirit of Hong Kong mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, will find its way. Yes, yes. Um, so turning to some of the questions that are coming in, do please submit more questions through the Q&A if you'd like to. Um, Miranda asks, um, how do you think the pandemic will affect networks of globalization, uh, particularly in relation to Hong Kong? So this is something that um, maybe some of our um, business alumni would be uh, better <laughs> to answer, but if you want yes, to so. <laughs> your best shot, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I think that um, we have to keep in mind that China and Hong Kong have actually been quite successful, all, comparatively at least, in controlling the pandemic and that um, in all likelihood, as a result, as things revive, you know, that will further um, increase Hong Kong's engagement with China because the Chinese economy, the mainland economy is open for business um, and, and they've done very well in a, you know, high end kind of way um, in, in achieving this. Um, Hong Kong has, you know, long since, you know, begun to de-emphasize the U.S., you know, and that what I talk about in the book, you know, really is a history at this point. Um, and that in that sense, Hong Kong has 
diversified um, its interests and pivoted much more towards mainland China as the mm. source of economic opportunity. Um, but yeah, with the, the pandemic, I think all, all bets are off. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then um, Giovanna asks about your interactions with China. I'm guessing she means the Chinese authorities while you're working on this book um, and what sort of reactions are coming out of China so far to the book or what, what, what reactions you might anticipate. The short answer is really uh, no reactions yet, although there's we might have a Chinese translation down the road, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm of, of, I'm curious as to see if there is any reaction and what that reaction is. Um, in many ways, I think that the arguments I'm making in the book um, are useful and even, you know, might even be welcome by um, some of the mainland authorities because some of their accusations about um, collusion and foreign collaboration in Hong Kong, um, the book shows actually were very much the case in the 1950s and 1960s. You know, the head of the Chinese University of Hong Kong was in the pay of a proxy of the US government. Um, you know, um, you know uh, and so that isn't still the case by any means but that in terms of this history, there absolutely was US involvement in Hong Kong behind the scenes in ways that it was not admitting at the time and, and who knows about now, but um, you know, that may prove useful to their propaganda, I don't know. <laughs> well, on that subject, um, John Casey asked about the provocative term you, you used money laundering uh, with regards to US financing of soft power outlets in Hong Kong. Why, he wants to know why you used that term. The more academic term is that there's a state private network going on um, and that um, the US government's outreach agencies, particularly through the State Department, are making substantial donations um, to uh, organizations that aren't charities. And then those organizations, most especially these, these missionary bodies and other educational foundations, which often their only major donor is the US government, mm -hmm. then spend this money in Hong Kong. Um, and it does alarm the colonial government on money laundering and other issues. And they generally just choose to ignore it like they choose to ignore a lot of other issues at this time period that are explosive to touch. Um, but they're, they're well aware of many of these organizations in Hong Kong, that they're not private organizations and that the bulk of their funds comes to US. And that's been very useful to my research as the colonial government keeping tabs on all of this and how many dollars are being spent. Um, uh, and they just choose to to leave it, you know. And again, the banking sector in Hong Kong is is very unregulated, so it would have been difficult to prosecute almost anyone for money laundering in Hong Kong at this time. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Donal has asked um, a couple of um, questions that are interrelated. Um, he talks about Hong Kong as potentially being past its sell-by date. Um, or you know, to what extent does Hong Kong have a long term future? And then he points out, you know, just 10 years ago, Portugal was undertaking works contracts in Macau. Now China owns large segments of the Portuguese utilities economy. Um, will China need Hong Kong as a trading entrepot 10 years from now? Uh, the future questions. Um, <laughs> Hong Kong is still very useful in a number of ways. Um, you know, it, it is comparatively less important than it was before. I think that that's pretty widely agreed upon. Um, but it still plays several key functions in the Chinese economy that it doesn't have to anymore. It's no longer a question of expertise per se or, or anything like that, but instead a question of how the Chinese government wishes to design their economy to operate. You know, and that the easiest example is foreign exchange. You know, and that you know, uh, Hong Kong is still basically exclusively the center of foreign exchange dealings. You know, um, and that this suits them in a variety of ways. Um, Hong Kong is also a very useful out valve for things within the Chinese economy, um, outflows of money um, in this mm. case as well, and round tripping money in a variety of ways. Chinese companies that incorporate in Hong Kong and then come back again to pick up privileges of being a foreign company, et cetera. And so again, we have to dig into the weeds to see those things operating. Um, but they still are very useful and directly incorporating Hong Kong directly into the mainland would of course make those impossible, you know, and you would have to replace those functions, most especially in this case, finding another way to 
reform Chinese currency to be exchangeable, um, you know, you know, without Hong Kong playing this special function. Um, as well as that, you know, and this would obviously never feature in any official state media or, or narratives, but that for the private individuals of Chinese officials, um, many, many, many officials park their money in Hong Kong, buy real estate in Hong Kong, you know, as a, a, an insurance policy of sorts, um, in part because also you, you gain a Hong Kong passport with, with the purchase of real estate over a certain threshold. Um, and so for high up senior officials, that is a perfectly legal you know, way to guard some of your assets and, and gain another passport that is a more mobile passport than the PRC passport. Um, so in all those ways, Hong Kong is still a functional, you know, functionally useful place for the PRC economy. And my guess, you know, which again, take it with a grain of salt, but I would, my, my prediction would be that by and large, Hong Kong will play a kind of, remain a separate kind of Monte Carlo kind of place um, that is useful in its, in its mild separateness um, for, the, for the foreseeable future. I mean, I haven't been since 2017, but it certainly didn't feel like it was um, past its sell-by date then. Um, you know, it's, it's such a vibrant um, economy, a vibrant, um, lively, useful place. Um, it's it is there is a lot of wealth there you know that's oh, yeah. i mean um you know the uh why, isn't it? um you know just in the again the most kind of basic way you know for initial public offerings you know the vast majority of of chinese companies that go go public you know do so in hong kong and thus become legally hong kong companies mm. uh, that is useful um you know and kind of, uh, opens up all sorts of different doors mm. for them um you know, uh, not always obvious to see, but they're there. So um, taking us in a slightly different direction, one of our PhD students, um, Luca Yao, asks um, if you have come across any sources about the children of these Kwashiung, um families, and what was it like growing up in this trans-Pacific, transnational environment where they would be, you know, what kind of schools were they going to? At what age might they first go to the US? Um, so um, just looking at that, um, the, the child's perspective on all this. Yeah, and that um, in the 70s and 80s, it, it, it is those children who have largely grown up in Hong Kong as the children of the migrants who came around 1949, you know, that kind of the book begins to focus on. Um, but I've managed to speak with or do research on lots of the other descendants of the people that I talk about, many of whom no longer live in Hong Kong. And so I think that's another reason that this history is interesting, but also difficult to track and kind of doesn't show up in necessarily a concerted way in Hong Kong. And that what I'm talking about is not an identity, um, never really coalesces in that way. Um, and that often the kind of the, the educational choices that were this long-term strategy did indeed begin you know, in elementary and secondary school, and depending on who we're talking about, either kind of these elite, you know, kind of international schools in Hong Kong, but for much more ordinary families, you know, particularly limited means after 1949, very actively choosing American missionary schools in Hong Kong as a path, you know, kind of a portal to other things, you know, and that um, you know, scholarship opportunities, recommendations, particularly as I try to show um, as it becomes common knowledge that the US government is much more interested in people who have studied math and science um, and scholarship opportunities are available there um, that pushes people into particular kinds of programs and, and uh, circulations around the Pacific. Um, and of course, also as, as we and I have talked about um, the other siblings, you know, and that in the course of, of this narrative, I often have to focus on one particular child of, of a family who goes on to take over the company, but that they often have many siblings, um, many of whom live quite comfortable lives in California and other places because they, uh, for better or for worse, they, they didn't take over in the same way that their, say, elder, el elder brother did. Um, and then um, I'm going to need to hand back to um, Professor Reeve Patton in just a minute, but um, finally a question from John Casey about um, this new enhanced access that you mentioned to all of these Hong Kong newspapers. Um, there's also, and to an extent, you know, much greater access to other Chinese newspapers. Um, this is, you know, a great era for online material 
at the same time as archives are kind of closing um, increasingly to foreign researchers at least. Um, so he just asked, you know, does that help give us insights into official thinking, his words in China, or um, perhaps we could expand that question a little bit to, you know, what were the, the great insights that you were able to, to get from some of these newspaper sources? Hmm. The Hong Kong Chinese press in particular, I think is a very useful alternative source to access 1970s, 1980s China, um, because they're doing the excellent work of documenting a lot of things um, that are going on and the activities of Hong Kong people in China. You know, and the kind of, um, for my case, their um, meetings, for example, with Deng Xiaoping or other senior officials um, that are, uh, would easily be left out of other narratives. Um, you know, the Hong Kong press is obsessed with recording that and talking about and interviewing them afterward. What did you talk about with Deng Xiaoping, um, et cetera. And so that it was a useful alternative that you know, the Xinhua News Agency did not issue press releases about those conversations, but the Hong Kong press is very interested mm -hmm. in it. Some of, whom, some of whom are pro Beijing and some of whom are not, um, but they're all interested in, in kind of covering these activities that are going on, investments, conversations, um, and other kinds of, of um, less formal kinds of engagement between Hong Kong and China. In these. Mm -hmm. um, and then just returning to, to a couple of themes that have come up in the question, I'll make this the final one, but uh, Henry O, um, who is our sort of leading Trinity alumnus um, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, um, thanks us for the event, but he wants to ask a little bit more about what, where you see the influence of um, China on Hong Kong in the next five to 10 years. Um, having seen this sudden change last year in the amount of control that the mainland is exerting. Um, and he points out that the impact of that is particularly huge for the young generation. So what do you think is gonna happen with um, young people who are coming to maturity who might've gone into the family business perhaps in the past, will, will this change now? Um, a tough question. Um, I think in part because, you know, this is part of what makes Hong Kong so interesting. Things have evolved very rapidly and that a lot of the people that I'm talking about are no longer the same dominant business elites in Hong Kong. And that in particular, you have so many um, uh, kind of formerly mainland families who have come to Hong Kong and built companies and done very well there, um, who have a different background and a different history and a different kind of thinking about, about Beijing. Um, I think for young people in Hong Kong, it, it just, again, it really, like all things in Hong Kong, it really depends on their class background, you know, and that Hong Kong is an unusual society in which the vast majority of upper class and upper middle class people all have foreign passports. Um, and that um, enables all sorts of different options for those students, those families um, to think about their future that the, ordinary majority of Hong Kong people don't have. Um, and they, they can't waltz into Vancouver or Sydney um, and, and carry on in a different kind of life. Um, but I think that, you know, to hit back on the themes of the book, higher education will continue then to play an important role in that um, higher education can be a first path to migration if you don't have that option otherwise, you know, through your passport. Um, and that, you know, uh, if, if people, want to cultivate other options and consider other destinations, um, that would be one way to do it. Thank you. Uh, um, on that note, I will hand back to, um, to Professor Patton. Um, thank you very much, Peter. And the, the book is available. And uh, do look at the Columbia University Press website for Made in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Isabella. And I'm really reluctant to bring this to a close because I can see lots more really fascinating questions that have come in. Uh, but it has been a, a rich and a truly illuminating discussion between the two of you. And Peter, I'm just so impressed by the way in which you brought in culture and class and economics with such fluency uh, and, and really showcased this very different story of Hong Kong in its modern guise. Thank you very much for being our faculty in focus and subjecting yourself to this ordeal. Um, many on the book. I wish you the best of luck with it. Isabella, as always, terrific to have you with us. Thank you for uh, the, uh, the conversation. Thanks also to Francesca and Aoife, as always, who put the uh, fellow faculty and focus together. And thank you to everyone in the audience who has joined us for your questions, 
And particularly, I'm, I'm so pleased that we have uh, our distinguished uh, alumni with us for this very special conversation. Please do join us again. Keep an eye on the, on the Hub website because I think you'll find many more events that you will be interested in. So I look forward to seeing you again on, uh, on another occasion. Uh, have a good day, everybody, and goodbye.